going to finish part two today and then part three on Friday. It's probably a little too optimistic, um, so we'll spill over into Monday. But uh, I put on Blackboard um, two readings for next week. So you should download those, print them out um, over the weekend, and uh, read those and bring them to class next week. So the two are, um, they're both from the Metaphysics of Morals. Um, the first one is the Introduction to the Metaphysics of Morals, and then the Introduction to the Doctrine of Right. The second one is the Preface and then the Introduction to the Doctrine of Virtue. Um, so those are the two books in the Metaphysics of Morals, and basically I have the introductory material um, to So as I say, we'll probably spill over a little bit of part three into Monday, um, and then we'll start talking about um, the metaphysics of morals, both doctrine and frame. Okay, so we were just about to talk about the examples that Kant gives to the formula of universal law. And I said last time that there are four examples because there are both perfect and imperfect duties to ourselves and to others. So I, I guess I didn't clarify sufficiently um, what the perfect, imperfect duties, uh, that contrast was supposed to be. So perfect duties are going to be um, duties that we can never, we may never act against. So these are going to be things that we may never do. And imperfect duties are going to tell us that we must adopt some end. We must take some goal to be good. Now, of course, we have lots of ends. We have lots of goals. We have lots of things that we take to be good. So exactly how and when we pursue those necessary ends, so, so a, an imperfect duty is going to tell us that it's rationally required to adopt some end. So those are necessary ends. Um, but exactly how and when we are to pursue those necessary ends is something that's not specified. So there's going to be some discretion in how we integrate those ends with our other ends and how we pursue them. Okay, so, so maybe it's easier to see how we're going to get the perfect duties because the maxims in these examples are all going to be impermissible. They're all supposed to be maxims that we cannot will to be universal law. So when a maxim says that we will do something and it's impermissible to act on that maxim, well, it's not permissible to do that then. And so we're going to have a perfect duty not to do that thing. So a maxim that has us do a certain thing that's impermissible means that it's impermissible to do that then. Okay, but when a maxim says we won't do something, a maxim says I won't do a certain thing, and that's impermissible, that maxim cannot be universalized, then what's required is that we do adopt a certain end, because it's impermissible not to do something. Um, and that's going to be an imperfect duty. That's going to be what's what generates a requirement that we adopt a certain end, it tells us, maybe it would be helpful to put it this way, it's going to tell us we may not neglect a certain end, which is required. But as I said, there's going to be some discretion typically in how we pursue that end, um, how we integrate it with our other end. Okay, and I want to remind you one more time that Kant thinks these examples are not controversial. He doesn't give much of an explanation for them. He thinks it would be obvious um, why. Um, and I myself think that 
um, we're not really going to be able to fully make sense of these examples and why things, why Kant thinks they're impermissible until we get later formulations of the categorical theory. And let me be clear about this. What I'm suggesting is not simply that, well, it's not that, we can simply forget about the formula of universal law and concentrate on other formulations. Instead, what I think is that the other formulations, the formula of humanity that we'll talk about later, I actually think that that is going to help us understand the formula of universal law more clearly. And it's going to do that by specifying what our necessary ends are. So the formula of humanity that we'll get later on will tell us certain rational, rationally required ends. And once we see what those are, then we'll be able to come back and look at the formula of universal law to see whether certain maxims can be universalized consistently or not. And it's going to turn out that some of them cannot be universalized because if they were to be universalized, if we were to will that they be universalized, that would conflict with a rational will pursuing its necessary ends, the necessary ends that we get more clearly in the formula of humanity. So there's going to be a contradiction in willing a maxim to be a universal law because doing that will conflict with other things that a rational will necessarily does. Okay, we'll see. Okay, um, so quickly let's look at the four examples here. Um, so this is on 34, um, starting just above 422. So the first example is supposed to be um, a perfect duty to oneself. And the example here is um, that someone suffers a series of setbacks, Kant says, and feels weary of life, has nothing to live, feels like he has nothing to live for, and asks whether it's permissible to act on this maxim. Here's the maxim that it's considering. It says, from self-love, I make it my principle to shorten my life. If when protracted any longer, it threatens more ill than it promises agreeableness. So this is all based on the inclinations that I happen to be feeling, the empirical inclinations. And he says that this maxim couldn't possibly serve as a law of nature. Um, so the thought here is somewhat unclear, but it seems to be that Kant is imagining something like an order of nature, and this maxim is universalized, an order of nature in which uh, a being would destroy itself when it's unhappy with its condition, and somehow thinking about an order of nature this way involves some kind of contradiction. Um, Kant doesn't tell us exactly how this is supposed to work. It seems to be that what he's relying on is some kind of account of the, like the natural purpose of an order of nature, that it's somehow self-sustaining or something like that, that this would contradict that. Um, and you remember that um, earlier on, when in, in the very first, near the beginning of the part one, um, he gave this argument that um, concerning the purpose that nature has given us for rationality. Um, and he said then that nature has given us instincts, uh, empirical desires, for the purpose of preserving life. Okay, well, so this maxim does seem to contradict that, but of course, um, As it stands, I don't see any more reason to accept um, that assumption about the purpose of nature now than there was before. On the other hand, notice that if there were a necessary end, an end that was rationally required, and if this maxim conflicted with that, then we could say that this maxim 
if universalized, would be inconsistent with a necessary end. There would be a contradiction in rational willing. That, uh, if, if rational willing involves this necessary end, and willing this maxim to be universal, conflicted with that, then a rational will would be conflicted against itself. This maxim could not be universalized. So this is what I was alluding to before, and we'll see with the formula, the formula of humanity what that necessary end is. Okay. Uh, perfect duty to others, not to make false promises. So here on uh, 34, further down, uh, sorry, on to 35, um, we have um, a perfect duty to the others. The example is someone needs money, uh, and knowing that he won't be able to repay it, he formulates the following maxim. So here's the maxim that's relevant. When I believe myself to be in need of money, I shall borrow money and promise to repay it, even though I know that it will never happen. So we ask whether I could will that this be universal law, and I consider what would happen if, in fact, everybody acted on this maxim. And it turns out that if everyone, um, it turns out that if everyone felt that there was no reason to follow through with their promises once the one they made, um, then that would undermine the purpose built into the maxim of trying to um, get money, in this case, or satisfy one's information in general. So in that case, people might continue to use the words, I promise, um, but those acts would be ineffective in bringing about the end specified within that maxim because Everybody would be acting on that. Um, so the effort to bring this maxim to the status of a universal law undermines itself. Undermines itself in the sense of undermining its ability to successfully will the end that's specified in that very maxim. Okay, further down on 35, we have the example of an imperfect duty to self. Um, and this is a requirement not to neglect one's, one's natural talent, developing one's talents. So here are the examples. Someone finds, a, finds a, a latent talent, he says, that could, quote, make him a useful human being in all sorts of respects, but finds himself in comfortable circumstances and prefers to give himself up to gratification rather than to make the effort to expand and improve his uh, his um, fortunate natural predispositions that relate to talent. Okay, um, so Kant's claim is that in this case, we can imagine this maxim being a universal law. We can imagine that condition. There's no contradiction in imagining that maxim being universal, but there is a contradiction in will. There is a, a, a practical contradiction willing that that maxim be universal, because in willing it, he says, we would be depriving ourselves of the means to accomplish some end. So remember, this is supposed to be talent or an ability, which if developed, would be useful. So this is supposed to be a talent or ability, which, de which if developed, would help us achieve certain ends. Um, so willing this to be a universal um, law conflicts with willing of those ends, whatever they are, um, that this talent would be able to serve. So here they're supposed to